Hello, this is part B of the presentation on perspectives on high performance computing in the big data world. This is Jeffrey Fox. This is the longer version of the presentation. Uh, the original presentation, which is also available in video, was given at HPDC 2019, the 28th version of this conference in Phoenix, Arizona. And in this longer version, we have a little more on actually data science and some Im implications of various trends for that as well as other, the other areas. Thank you. So these communities here, we have AI systems, HPC, cloud, big data, data science, or what I somewhat prefer these days, the AI first approach. And we'll look at uh, how everything fits together. So if you sort of recap where we are, we have the HPC, or actually more precise, the HPDC, because if you look at modern cloud computing, it's more distributed computing than cluster computing. It's them mixed together, which is the whole philosophy behind HPDC, high, high performance distributed computing. And if you look at the number of students going into the field, the papers published, which we surveyed, and new faculty ads, it's uh, it's not uh, a decline. It's not declined dramatically, but it's certainly not. It does not seem to be growing. And that's a, so you could view this as slightly surprising because we're living in the big data world. Now it seems sort of trivially obvious if you need big anything. The reason HPC was born is big simulations. Well, why wouldn't big data need HPC? Uh, in fact, it obviously does need HPC, except possibly for Hadoop-style big data management, where you're where you're stinging bytes around, where you still actually need high performance, but it's high performance on the I/O side, and MPI I/O is not the best way to do that. So anyway, so why is that? It's possibly because the Communities are not well aligned because industry is suddenly using HPC. Industry adopted GPUs to process both Bitcoin and um, deep learning with dramatic acceleration. And uh, we need to uh, pay attention to that because this mainstream, which I equivalence with industry for this talk, is larger. And it's got a, in the, by, when you say it's supported by industry, immediately billions of dollars flow in. There is a conference, a recent new conference called SysML, which is sort of relevant to look at because um, it has uh, it has actually talks on what I would consider HPC for uh, big data, and it's uh, but it's only a mainstream systems. And in fact, the word systems is probably what I should have listed on some of those communities because the systems community um, includes the HPC community. And as well, there was a time when systems people focused on parallel computing and then HPC, and now they're focused on bioinformatics and machine learning and things like that. And the machine learning community is sort of separate from the actual traditional systems community. This conference is quite interesting because it has a 50-50 ratio essentially between academic and industry talks. There is a strong cloud community. I still remember when clouds were of five to ten percent of the of the world, and people were discussing whether and how how well they would do. Well, there is no doubt what's happened. Clouds have been incredibly successful. They're growing almost thirty percent per year of public clouds, and um, the only trouble is that this strength is focused in industry. And it is not very large academically, but in terms of either the use of clouds to do science or in the research. There is some good, solid, good, and exciting research in clouds academically. But as industry has all the data, or most of the data, and has such a strong interest in making clouds run incredibly well, because it's their bread and butter, uh, then the academic uh, contributions are, are not so easy to make. The big data community, I think, is actually pretty strong in both academic, uh, academia and industry. It's not quite so well defined, and because uh, um, lots of things are big data, it's certainly growing, as we saw in the conference. Uh, but still, we noted it's actually quite small in terms of summed over, over activities. 
Uh, I would say myself that I'm part of the big data community. Because I only use HP, although I have a long involvement with HPC, I tend to use it when necessary. And I, but I'm always doing big data because that's what everything is these days. Okay, this slide actually gives some detail of the two days of this conference. Um, there's obviously too much detail for for you to study, and actually, if I don't speak very much, you won't have any time to look at it. So I better find something to say, uh, so we can look at what the topics are: parallel and distributed learning, hardcore um, machine learning, security and privacy. So that's obviously a critical part of this field. Video analytics, so probably the hottest area in the in this um, in this field, where the huge amount of deep learning is being done. And it's doing down for all sorts of good and bad reasons. Um, we didn't here. We have actually a keynote on the edge, uh, AI at the edge. Here we have a keynote on fairness, another, another controversial, critical thing about AI. We have um, hardware, novel hardware, and customized hardware like the TPU is very, very important. Here we have another session on hardware and debugging. And the section three, session three on the second day is on training and inference. That is the hardcore learning that we have to do. And finally, programming models, ways of making it easier to produce these um, AI networks and things like that. So this is all um, all hardcore. Um, but it has systems, parallel learning systems, hardware systems. And compiling your systems, but it's all machine learning oriented. You're not seeing the performance of the um, of the simulation of the next battery on exascale hardware discussed at this conference. Uh, so if we sort of uh, make a little cosmic slide on the importance of AI, uh, we and this is sort of underlies why we're discussing all of this. There is little doubt, based on Wall Street. And in and sort of obvious progress in both science and industry, that AI and the parts of machine learning will dominate over the next 10 years. It will have incredibly distinctive impact on applications. HPC, clouds, and big data are, are essential because you can't actually use AI without HPC and clouds. And big data is actually, if you like, the, oh, the umbrella field for putting machine learning into, into action. But um, somehow they're not quite as dramatic as AI. And we have this term, AI first. I give here a set of um, web clips, the race for AI, um, where all these companies are grabbing startups. Google, Facebook, and Microsoft are remaking themselves around AI. Google, the full stack AI company. Bezos says AI to fuel Amazon's success. Microsoft says AI is the ultimate breakthrough. Tesla, was new AI guru, will help cars teach themselves. Um, Netflix is using AI to conquer the world. Google is remaking itself as a machine learning first. Well, that's a variant of what I call AI first. And here, if you love machine learning, you should check out General Electric, who in his software, with his software like Predix, and the industrial Internet of Things is clearly a, a major player in the, AI, in the AI, and AI is essential for modern manufacturing and modern machines. So we have obviously a very strong effort in data science, both in industry and academically. But there is an alternative way of thinking about this, which is AI first, followed by a subject, such as AI first physics, which is the use of AI as a driver of physics, AI first, engineering, cyber infrastructure, social science, history, what have you. And it's not clear to me that AI first is not a clearer way of explaining what you're doing. Because data science, it's not very clear what it is. Is it just the study of machine learning or what? I have some other slides in a longer presentation which explore that issue. Okay, folks, this is a little bit of a diversion because there's a bit of a hobby horse of mine, namely, what is data science? Is it AI first, which is a rather broad concept with an application focus? Is it 
the theory of machine learning or what? If we look at, uh, say, Gartner, who's done several very informed studies of industry, they have this sort of interesting chart, unfortunately from some years ago, but it's the only chart I can find of this type. It tries to tell you the difference between data science, citizen data science, data engineers, unicorns, that's what you should be. Um, quant geeks, people who revolutionized Wall Street. Software engineering, classic. Thing that we used to, we still train um, master students to do, and then the domain experts. So we have all of them here, and Gartner has a nice decomposition: domain understanding, IT skills, and quantitative skills. And uh, you can see here, citizen data science are actually weaker than data science in all areas. I doubt that that's actually true in practice, because typically a citizen data science is is somebody who's being retrained to be a data scientist, starting off with, say, lots of, lots of domain understanding. So, uh, though, so although they may not need lots of, so uh, I would say, I know a lot of companies actually are growing their data science uh, expertise by starting with citizen data scientists. I'm sort of ha ha hung up on data engineers because the, that's the type of people I want to hire in my research group. Because I need people who know about machine learning and systems. That's what a, you might think a data engineer does, although sometimes it's defined very narrowly to be the equivalent of a database uh, administrator. And you're really just doing the screwing around with the mechanics of the data systems. So it would be good to understand this better. How, to what extent does industry want software engineers, people who are sort of Pure machine learning people, or what does it need? And people who know some systems and some data science, and somehow either have some domain expertise or can talk to domain experts, or with the, maybe the citizen data scientist to know what the company wants. And we have here some um, interesting results from Indeed.com. Unfortunately, Indeed.com's results are so valuable, they've stopped making them available. So they only run up to the middle of a uh, of 2017, and here we have a plot of the job postings representing data science, which is right at the bottom. Those that have computer engineering, 3.7 percent, a dominant request, and people who want cloud, which is pretty high at 1.34 percent. Those are job postings. Let's look at the uh, uh, what the uh, the actual job applicants want. So here we have the job seeker interest. And we have exactly the opposite trend. Now we have data science at the top, uh, computer engineering at the bottom, and cloud is actually still in the middle. So there's, uh, there is a clear sort of mismatch between people wanting to do data science and jobs advertising data science. Except I am told that data science is still a Really hot area because there just aren't enough people satisfying the jobs which are called data science. I think it's also true there are not enough people satisfying the jobs called cloud, but that's not quite so sexy at the moment. <coughs> okay, the next slide is kind of I saw from Google, like most things in life, Google did them first. And he points out the machine learning code, oh, let's make it red. Um, is not such a large part of any real system. Here's auto-tuning, which we'll discuss later, configuration. Here's the servers, and here's all the screwing around with the data, and the monitoring of the system, and the et cetera, et cetera. And this is worth bearing in mind. It's related to my comment. We don't just need people who know about machine learning. We've got to build this giant thing. Anyway, that's not me, that's Google. And it was in NIPS in uh, 2015, so it's quite an old remark. Um, and so if we um, try to summarize what we'll need in this future world, we're gonna need hardcore machine learning community to get better machine learning algorithms. I, in my opinion, we need lots and lots of AI first communities. And we need to build high performance big data systems. High performance big data systems must be the future. The question is whether they're built by this group, or this group, 
all the whole group together. And this is all part of practical computer science, which is, of course, very promising. Thank you very much. Let's move on. All right, now we discuss a little bit about what industry is doing and how we could possibly uh, align with it effectively. So I have actually uh, four area topics which I will discuss. And we have a variant of these slides for each of the areas. So we have the importance of clouds, a uh, rather small summary, I mean, that's more focused topic, I should say, ML Puff, the so-called global AI supercomputer, and this wonderful phrase, machine learning for systems and systems for machine learning, which comes from Google's Jeffrey Dean. Which is, and they will follow that with the next major section on using machine learning to transform computing. All right. All right, the first of our industry alignment uh, issues is the dominance of cloud computing. Uh, these figures and pictures come from a report by Cisco, which uh, started around a couple of years ago, but it was updated in November 2018, and the lessons are essentially unchanged in 2018. And clouds are growing 22% per year. And that's actually public clouds are growing even faster than that, and private clouds only 11% per year. But traditional data centers are declining 5% per year. Um, if you look at how this increase is um, happening, you can see it's partly due to the workloads per server that that's going up from. Uh, by clouds are in 2016 are 3.6 times as many as uh, as um, traditional centers, and that number is essentially constant, but is now that means 13 per server instead of 3.8 per server. In another um, interesting figure is how many large data centers are there, which are called hyperscale data centers in the jargon, which I think came from Gartner, but maybe from, they certainly Gartner uses it, maybe it comes from somebody else. The number of giant data centers going up 13% per year, and it's going to reach uh, over 600 in 2021. If you ask how many computers there are, it's maybe 50 million. I don't know. It's very difficult to tell because that's a proprietary secret. So you can't actually extract it from, from the published data from all these uh, cloud vendors, except sometimes you can get some accidental hints. All right, the next topic, ML Puff. Well, this is a much more focused comment here. We were talking about the clouds being a cosmic issue affecting everything. ML Puff is a simple, elegant project uh, organized by industry and some in leading edge academia, Berkeley, uh, MIT, Harvard, um, Stanford. Um, Places, several places, nine, nine places. But there are about 70, I think, industry people. It was started uh, a year ago. And it is basically uh, a collection of data sets and a collection of me measurements trying to build up a, a, an understanding of what, how to get good performance in machine learning. Um, they started with training. Uh, and um, then they now have added inference. So they do inference and training, which of course have rather different characteristics. Uh, training takes a lot longer, but inference also has to run with high performance because it's often done on the edge, um, away from the giant cloud. And they keep, they have a rather uh, they have a, some good processes. There are various working groups. I go to the research working group, the HPC working group, and the uh, deep learning for time series working group. But there are others, even larger working groups than that on the mainstream industry foci. I think this is, science should look at this, or academia should look at this, and either join it or set up something similar to this. Uh, I think we need to do more than we're now doing on understanding the performance of machine learning on systems of various types. And it has to cover both I.O. and compute. 
Otherwise, we, I, I don't think we can continue just using top 500 and things like that. That's too small, and or even deep 500. Those are, they're not, um, they haven't got quite the rigor, rigor and relevance of ML Perf. Uh, here is an example of some information gathered by ML Perf, which uh, I, we have actually a couple here from uh, Indiana at the bottom, which I added. Uh, the IndyCar racing. Data set is very exciting. That's Judy Chu, and she also did some work on uh, clustering for Twitter online Twitter data. So these are all um, possible important uh, time series, which um, either typically involve deep learning, although not. It's not clear that deep learning is can be used if you really want to have real time, truly real time results. Because there's a these applications like uh, right hailing, I don't think you need the answer in 10 nanoseconds. If you're looking for the trends in that to know how to route your cars, I think delays of uh, seconds is quite acceptable. So they, that's another interesting feature. Now if you look at this, we have cars, medical, security, the overall statistics of the world, stock market, where we know uh, being a nanosecond ahead is um, important. We have climate where Bill Tang has done some wonderful work on Tucker Maps and using well, using AI on uh, data measurements to predict the instabilities. There are events and software systems, and of course, language and translation and speech are very important because that's a, that's a dominant industry application where real time. On very near real time, our results are certainly important. They have to be done, so they are. They need to be done. Um, possibly not quite as fast as the racing car, which has to be done immediately before the car crashes. That's going 200 miles an hour, so that's pretty fast. Um, so let's let's move on. All right, our third example: the global AI supercomputer. All right, we should. Be part of this concept. So, the Microsoft had a very good faculty summit in 2018, which I was privileged to be invited to. And there, in the summary, they pointed out that they were building a global AI supercomputer. We will discuss the, the meaning of this uh, in the next slide. The word global is important because it means it's shared. Well, it actually isn't shared because Microsoft, Google, Amazon have their own supercomputers. But it is true that if we look at the world, the AI impact on the world is going to be done by the sum of all the different supercomputers, and hopefully including supercomputers owned by scientists doing things for the good of the world and maybe even solving scientific research questions. Uh, it's worth noting that as espoused by Microsoft, that is AI on the edge and AI on the cloud. And they're linked together, of course, by high-speed nets, which are getting better and better. And you're obviously going to do more training on the cloud and more inference on the edge. And um, you're going to, what I discussed latency in the previous slide, depending on the latency of the required reaction, you're going to decide where to do it. So we look at this here, here for instance, clouds are not so to be so clearly trusted. They have infinite capability, and they will certainly be the place to go if you want to get all the world's data. Edges have low latency. They can be somewhat trusted if they're because they're not in, in, in contact with uh, contaminating devices. They are obviously limited. And they obviously are typical, whether we have cameras, speakers, watches, smartphones, dot, dot, dot. So, Global says it is an HBDC, it's a high performance distributed computing system. It's distributed within each vendor. Microsoft's Global Supercomputer is not in one place, it's spread over the world. And they say it's also spread over vendors. I actually use the term global AI and modeling supercomputer, which is my suggested um, cosmic architecture, because we want to include modeling, because we have to do models to uh, do AI, and we have to do models to do simulation, where we want to create the digital t twins for industry, or, or study, uh, um, you know, 
and what the protein folding and things for science, that those are all done by supercomputers. So we need modeling supercomputers. So I want to do integrate big data and simulation within this concept. Notice that uh, when, when compared to say the old ideas of grids, uh, we have here a grid, um, which is the edge part of the global AI supercomputer. The cloud part of the global AI supercomputer is sort of at the logical center of the system, but is physically distributed. So it's a physically distributed, logically centralized uh, system. Although there are multiple centers, because we have Google, uh, Oracle, IBM, Microsoft, Amazon, etc., Alibaba. Um, so we're going to, as I've said, it is essential to use HPC to do almost anything in the global AI and modeling supercomputer. And this is what we call a later concept called HPC for machine learning. And we must use HPC to get good results on machine learning. And we also must support the IO-centric data management, which is what Hadoop uh, is, uh, sent, is, uh, was originally designed to do, and Spark and Flink and uh, other, kind of other systems like that are, are dominant players. There are various controversies about how you actually build what I can call an HPC cloud, likely what is the nature of the I.O. system? Is it Luster or HDFS or simulated HDFS on Luster? What is the importance of SSD and non-volatile memory? And we also need, to, in my opinion, to fix MPI so it automatically runs well on cloud technologies like Mesos and Kubernetes and cloud languages like Java and Python. Okay, that's the end of that, so we need to take the global AI and modeling supercomputer and integrate it between industry and academia. All right, let's uh, finish this discussion of the um, global AI modeling super, uh, supercomputer. And uh, we, this, has a, this has the cloud and the edge in the same supercomputer, viewed as the same supercomputer, which is a good thing to do, because we have a coherent, interaction between the edge and the cloud. And that cloud, the edge has the real edge, the devices. And it has the fog. The fog is the GPU sitting in your in your car to accelerate to accelerate the deep learning used in the auto driving system. Because cars must have hundreds or maybe these days thousands of local sensors. I remember even I don't know, 15 years ago they had hundreds. So th that fog is the is the compute resources which sort of are shared by a lot of smaller devices. This is a logic in the fog and the devices form the logically and physically distributed edge. Remember the the cloud is physically distributed but logically centralized, the edge is logically distributed. The edge is structured. All those devices in the car share their fog. That's what it says here. The, your car, when it's just about to collide with the truck, will not borrow the computer in the truck to get its fog up to decide to avoid the truck. That is not a realistic, um, reliable, robust approach. So these, these, all these are differences from grids. In another critical difference is that it's data oriented not compute oriented. And also everything is very heterogeneous, varying accelerators, lots of memory issues, and lots of disk issues. So this is a very complex system which we need to deal with. But we should avoid making unnecessary complications. We, can, we should try to look at it in structured fashion so that we get some, some control of what's going on. Last topic, which is uh, heads towards the major thrust of this particular talk, machine learning for systems and systems for machine learning. And so that was a talk by Jeffrey Dean at NIPS in 2017 or December. And he discussed the machine learning actually for something which I have uh, worked on many times, optimizing parallel computing, load balancing, 
I mean, there's, there's a wonderful paper on learning index structures and showing how it does better than the traditional uh, best methods. There is uh, machine learning for data center efficiency and machine learning to replace heuristics and user choices, which I would summarize as auto-tuning, because that's effectively what tuning is. Heuristics and user choices are tuning, setting up the configurations of your systems. And um, so this thing on the up from this oh, thing here is his slide, and uh, he has done the world a great benefit by explaining these ideas. So if you look at the world systems in his discussion, well, for this talk, I'm going to replace systems by HPC. But I told you, I think HPC is needed for essentially all of these systems. We could also replace it by cyber infrastructure by HPDC, but uh, I know I'm sure you can actually call it systems. It's still actually systems. Um, so I, I use HPC because I want to focus on systems that can support big data, big simulation, and therefore always involve HPC. So we now get uh, M machine learning for HPC and HPC for machine learning, or say for this particular conference, HPDC, we could replace HPC by HPDC. Uh, and now, we have these HPC for machine learning is what I've actually worked on for the last five years. I think it's quite well studied, it's very important. It is not revolutionary, it is evolutionary, and it makes data analytics run faster. However, machine learning for HPC is revolutionary. Uh, some parts of it are evolutionary, like some of the auto-tuning are just doing better auto-tuning, but some of it, like producing surrogates, so you learn the results of a simulation or a digital twin, I think those are revolutionary. Um, I say at this faculty summit, there was a lot of discussion with our machine learning to improve big data systems, which is ML for systems, where they were improving MySQL, um, Hadoop, and things like that. All right. Next, last slide coming. We can divide HPC for ML into, <coughs> into two areas. HPC runs ML, that's the dominant component, where we're using high performance computing, hardware, and software to execute machine learning with high performance. There's also simulation <coughs> trained ML, where we have a, a, a net, say deep learning network, and we want to train that network, and we use simulations, which use HPC to run real fast, simulation of the effect, uh, such as the, uh, the impact of a, of a, in the light source, the impact of, of x-rays on materials to train the machine learning algorithm. That's particularly important in cases where it's hard to get either data or labeled data. The big advantage of a simulation is that automatically labeled, because you know what you simulated. This is actually quite similar to things we do in ML around HPC. We have, a, actually most of my work has been in HPC runs ML, and the software that implements that is called Twister2, and it uses high performance technology everywhere to produce, to do things similar to what Spark and um, Hadoop do. And this, I say, is my major emphasis. We have now have a little diversion on Twister 2, uh, and it's highlights are uh, given here. It is uh, essentially a big data programming environment, such as Hadoop, Spark, Flink, Storm, Heron. And uh, in listing all of those, it's combining batch processing with uh, streaming. Storm and Heron are purely streaming. And Twister 2 actually performs as well as Storm and Heron for streaming, but also does the Hadoops and Spark and Flink type activities as well. It effectively always outperforms the, at least not the if not the commercial optimized Apache systems, but the the open source freely available Apache systems. It preferably runs on the Kubernetes or Mesos, but Slurm is supported. It has a hyper. It has the data flow model, which is 
actually quite interesting because data flow is probably the natural way of doing ML around HPC. It supports iteration. It has different types of data flow, fine grain, coarse grain, dynamic. It does synchronization, asynchronization. I've already mentioned batch and streaming. It has three distinct communication environments. DFW, the data flow. Data flow has distinct source and target tasks. MPI always like is in the second bullet, box synchronous processing. It is doesn't work for data flow because it has uh, assumes that source and target tasks are the same. It also has a storm API twister to for streaming events. You can run a, a storm program under twister two and get the better communication. Performance because Storm is built around the data flow model as well. It has a, a technology equivalent to RDD for um, which are called T sets, which are called P collections in Beam, Apache Beam, data sets in Apache Flink, Streamlets in Apache Storm and Heron. So it's a broad based system. And it, uh, say it can be a pure batch engine, which is not built on a streaming engine, or a pure streaming engine supporting the Storm and Heron API, not built on a batch engine. Uh, we're adding fault tolerance at the moment I give this talk, and um, that, that can be naturally done at the data flow nodes. It has many APIs, data, communication, and task. And um, the higher level APIs, high communication as does Spark. And it has the low level Marine Corps API, which actually M M MPI should be Marine Corps. Um, should be MMMPI, Marine Corps Message Passing Interface. And I say the DFW supports the same primitives as MPI. It also supports MapReduce primitives, such as uh, uh, partition and join. It has a, that DFW can be done with or without keys, because we map keys are key for MapReduce. And uh, also, Twister 2 is a component-based architecture. It's a toolkit. You can take DFW out. It's called Twister.net and use it on its own, independent of the rest of Twister 2. Here is some results on a, a support vector machine running in parallel using stochastic gradient descent. And the times always for every level of parallelism, Spark is better than is always slower than Twister 2, so it's worse than Twister 2. And Twister 2, the T set, the higher level interface, is slower than the task, but not by very much. So this is the uh, T set, this is the task, actually, for this case, they're almost, uh, I mean, for these, the, the T set is, um, is actually a little better than the task here, but then they, generally they, the uh, you should, T set should be slower because it has additional functionality because it's got the the data model built into it. Spark is always slower, and MPI is slightly faster, which is what you'd expect. MPI is really lowest level with no overheads whatsoever. You can't beat MPI. We try to use MPI technology and add additional technologies without incurring significant overhead. This is a picture I quite like. It tries to describe the philosophy behind Twister 2 in a way that relates to machine learning around HPC. Um, this shows data flow. It shows two data flows, because in, in ML and HPC, we're running um, this computation, which could be a simulation or a data analytics. And we're running the machine learning to monitor, tune, and learn the results. Both of these could be data flow computations. They could exchange data back and forth, and they could talk to the edge and run on all sorts of complicated, heterogeneous hardware. So that's sort of the software model. It needs to be fleshed out, of course, because uh, these ideas about ML around HPC and are quite new, and we haven't really built anything significant at this stage. Thank you. That's the end of this Twister 2 diversion.